Welcome to Building the Future. I'm your host, Kevin Horick. You can check out new episodes of the show every Tuesday and Thursday at 2 p.m. If you missed an episode or want to get more information about the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. SUPEX, the Startup Expo, North America's premier startup conference, is March 6th and 7th, 2017, in sunny Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Affordably priced, SUPEX is a two-day international conference featuring workshops, panels, speeches, a $50,000 startup competition, and over 100 exhibitors. For more information, go to sup-x.org. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Bob Fitz, founder and producer at SUPEX, the Startup Expo. Bob, welcome back to the show. Kevin, always a pleasure to be on. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to have you back on the show. And actually, we're doing things a little bit different today. It's actually the 100th episode of the show. And so I thought, you know, you've been on the show a bunch of times, kind of on the radio and TV side of things. We've actually met in person. I was at... Um, the Startup Expo in February with you, and I thought for the 100th episode, maybe we'll uh, kind of do something a little bit different. But I, before we kind of do that, I want to talk a little bit about what exactly the Startup Expo is. So maybe if you want to give a quick overview of uh, what that exactly is and, and when and all the details surrounding that event in March. Well, thanks. Sure. Uh, first of all, congratulations on your hundredth show, and let me be a part of it. That's a great achievement, and uh, you know you should be deservedly proud. Um, Thank you. So, Supex, the Startup Expo, is a two-day international startup and early stage conference at the Broward Convention Center in Fort La- Fort Lauderdale, Florida, uh, on March sixth and seventh, two thousand seventeen. Uh, it should attract somewhere between thirteen hundred and fifteen hundred people from throughout the U.S. and Canada based on what the attendance was last year. And that'll be, you know, early stage entrepreneurs, um, angel and seed series and VC investors, other technologists. Uh, we have tons of accelerators from all over the North America come. And, uh, and then just people that are kind of inter- in, into all of that, including students. Uh, it's a two-day event. First day is essentially all workshops, and then the second day is more of a traditional conference with panels and speakers, et cetera. If people want to learn more, they can go to the event website, which is sup-x.org, sup-x.org. And uh, hopefully you'll be back down again and be one of our media partners and uh, and uh, help us out. Yeah, I'm definitely planning on it. Um, the, the thing is, I think that I would like to kind of mention is, obviously, I've been to a number of conferences over the years and whatnot. And Obviously, in in my opinion, and I'm not just saying this because you're on the show, like, I think it's probably the best conference I've ever been to. And not just because of like the, the speakers, like which were great and the, the sessions that you had were awesome, but the actual networking at that event was like the absolute best that I've ever been to. And like everybody was there, everybody was super nice and friendly and like totally open to networking. And I've never been to an event like that, like where everybody was just kind of introducing themselves to each other. And and I know I've mentioned to, to you before about this, but literally I just finished interviewing people for the show that I met in February and it's almost the end of September, right? And so that just goes to show how many great people I met just at one event over two days, right? Uh well, uh, thanks for saying that. And it, it, I do think it has a friendly vibe. Uh, you know, whatever the reason for that is, I'm not sure, but it does. And it is, it, it, you know, we, we, we really focus on content. Um, we want to make sure that it's an amazing learning opportunity for entrepreneurs. Uh, and it, we try to make it really affordable so that people from wherever throughout the U.S. and Canada, you know, we know they're going to have to travel and expend to money to get here. So it's not a break your bank type of event. And I'm glad you enjoyed it. And I mean, I go to a lot of these too. And frankly, I like my own event. I think it's a blast. Yeah, I had a great time. <laughs> so good. So. That's great. Well, maybe let's kind of get into um, kind of the reason we're doing this show and maybe start off with um, kind of changing the or turning the tables a little bit and you're going to interview me about a product that's actually launching today and we're kind of and we'll get more into kind of what it is and the partnership with that. So Kevin, thank you for being on my show today. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> so, 
Tell us about uh, Stax. So Stax has kind of been, I would probably say that this is version two of the platform. Um, it was originally named something else, and it's been around for a number of years in, in kind of a different form. Um, we spent the last kind of year, year and a half, you could maybe argue two years, building version two. Um, we've partnered with uh, a company out of Boston called EBSCO Industries. And um, what Stax is, is it's basically a um, website content management system for libraries, um, kind of public and academic. And, you know, we probably move into other spaces at, uh, at a certain point. And I, I know kind of when pe you tell people it's the library, you know, it's not really necessarily kind of the sexiest space. But what I like, and I'm the creative director on the, the project or product, sorry, I should say. And what I like about it is it's technically really challenging because what we're doing, and, and I'm sure anybody that's ever kind of tried to use either a public or academic library, um, sometimes they have to go to two or three websites to actually do research and what we're doing is we're bringing all a library, kind of no matter what it is, into one interface that they can use on kind of their desktop, tablet, or phone. And we're integrating with tons of third-party services and pulling it all into one interface. And so for me, it was really challenging because you have to deal with a bunch of third-party APIs and content and people are viewing, you know, ebooks online or they're watching video or, you know, any kind of, you think like when you go to a library, there's so many things and people can place holds and, uh, you know, to receive physical um, content or books or, or CDs or whatever, right? All from one interface. So there's a lot going on, right? And I love those challenges and kind of solving those big problems. So how did y'all get into the digital library business? How did this come about? Um, one of the partners on the product actually worked in the space for a number of years. And so it was kind of her brainchild and she's tried to build it for about a decade or so. And, and it's kind of in different versions. And, and this is kind of the actual version where we ended up partnering with uh, a big sales team, uh, EBSCO out of Boston to actually sell this. And we're, we're doing a North American launch today of the actual uh, product. And so EBSCO would go to libraries, public, university. Who would they go to to distribute the product? Yeah, that's that's exactly correct. They they have a number of relationships, and I and I'm sure anybody that's done kind of research or whatnot, um, they basically EBSCO is like a they basically house all the like research content, and we pull their content into our interface, and we work with them heavily to actually, um, you know display their content in kind of like a responsive interface and we also have native android and ios apps that you know do the same kind of thing so this might be uh either an incredibly stupid question or it might reflect my age but uh you know i haven't gone to a library in sure. gosh literally decades uh mm -hmm. and i'm i'm an information hog like i i love you know i you know what i call asking google stupid questions i i, I do research on stuff all the time just to educate myself what what is the digital library like what what you know how do people you know, we can talk about how what stacks does to help the libraries but you know can you just part of our audience sure. might have the same issue as i do explain people what the, what a digital library is and what people how they use them now sure no i to be fair, I was kind of in the same boat before I got involved in, in Stacks. And it's an interesting thing. And one of our big kind of selling features is obviously like you can download an ebook or, or whatnot from Amazon or the Google Play Store, or, you know, a handful of other different retailers. But we've built into the product where from Stacks Mobile, you can actually scan a barcode and um, get a digital copy of that book if it's available in kind of your library and you can start reading it right away so the use case that we talk about all the time is like why go buy a book from amazon or from you know if you're at the airport or something and you you see a book on a newsstand you could literally like pull out the app scan the barcode and just like start reading the book instantly free from your library right there's so much really good content that a lot of people don't know or think about 
you know, instead of going and spending fifteen, twenty dollars on a book or or whatever, it's or what, even renting it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, right. So so uh, a simple way of understanding it is it's just you're providing an interface uh, for people to go to their virtual library and get you know free what they would get elsewhere. I guess the challenge is is you were talking about the multiple APIs, and is it safe to say that? Um, some companies, you know, do that for magazines and some do it for books and some do it just for books on history and some do it just for science books. And you've kind of got to pull all that in there, uh, to create the inventory, uh, for each library or how does that, how does that work? Yeah, exactly. So we're integrating with like EBSCO's databases and then you're right. We're at integrating with the magazine providers. We're integrating with the, um, believe it or not, um, like the actual, book jacket covers and magazine covers sometimes come from a different third party and so it's it's quite it's quite challenging and it's interesting and I love that kind of challenge so yeah you're right it comes from a bunch of different different sources and we have to kind of piece it all together in an interface so the EBSCO relationship it sounds like it's enormous are they the biggest or one of the biggest uh, such distributors in the industry yeah, they're they're definitely in the at, at the top of that kind of pyramid or in the top you know couple um, depending on kind of the industry. Um, the interesting thing about them is they've been doing it for so long that mm-hmm. you know they're kind of highly regarded as they they basically have the most kind of research kind of content and which is which is great for us and it worked out really great when we kind of started that partnership. So they'll go out and line up the libraries for you. Uh, and so, so on the other side, what, what was it like uh, from a from your perspective as the creative director for the product? To walk a little bit through the challenges of. First of all, it must be different dealing with an enormous distribution partner who's your partner. I'm sure there's cultural differences, and then. And, and what was it like, you know, learning, learning the business and then kind of distilling that down and, okay, these are the technical challenges. That sounds really like a great challenge and opportunity and a super learning experience for you, I would imagine. Yeah, totally. The, the thing that's interesting about dealing with, um, you know, bigger companies like that and especially kind of coming at it from the design side of things is – and I've always kind of had this philosophy and it's finally kind of started to pay off in, in my career in the last few years is design for the web isn't an art piece. And I think a lot of designers forget that, right? It's not it's not really about what I think is the best look and feel in a lot of cases because sometimes I'm not the target market. And I'm not saying I should hate the design. It should still be good design. But our target audience is, you know, library patrons, university students, that kind of thing, right? And so for for a lot of cases, and, you know, we're doing user research and user testing. And if, you know, through that research and user testing, they say that the call to action button should be a different color than I think it should be, well, we're going to change it to that color. And so I think there's kind of some trade-offs, right? And I think a lot of it is when you're building stuff for kind of enterprise and, and big kind of scale, you need to almost step back and kind of take out your own assumptions and, and really do research. And, and they have some really good kind of user experience people over there that they're constantly doing research that we can reach out to. And they also work with a bunch of third parties. Plus, I've been doing this for, you know, over 20 years now. And so I, you know, just through my own experience in different industries kind of understand. So I think the big thing that I'm trying to stress here is it's it's really kind of a collaboration between getting user feedback, taking what the research that they've done kind of internally, plus our own experience, and then trying to say like, okay, well, you know, pulling a bunch of designers and developers in a room and for lack of a better term, almost arguing it out on a whiteboard saying like, how are we going to integrate with these services to build this feature at, from kind of the design and development side within the timeline that's allotted, right? And when you start breaking it down like that, it can get kind of quite complicated and, and trying to make it simple. And then you say, well, now it needs to work on a desktop, tablet, and phone, right? Because a lot of people um, don't 
for for a lot of people, their only device might be a tablet or phone, right? And they they don't even check the internet anymore on a laptop or a desktop. So I guess one of the lessons here, uh, from a design standpoint, I'm assuming you're addressing the designers out there, is you know don't go too far down the rabbit hole in your little whiteboard session without doing sufficient testing and having experts involved that know how to do that well. Is yeah, that fair. To- Totally. So, like when I'm even whiteboarding, like I'll have a developer in the room so we can kind of argue. For, I, and I, when I say argue, I don't mean that in like the negative term. Like yeah, yeah, I yeah. want I want that argument. I want them to say like, no, 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 that's not buildable or whatnot. Right. Like I I want that feedback. And I think it's trying to break down the silos. Right. A little bit. But it's also important to have the marketing people in there. Because- totally. Yeah, and so can you just give the audience maybe an example of when we say research more specifically, you know, what did they do that you were impressed by their ability to gather some research around something that was that was compelling against your intuition that showed you the value that you know, hey, that that's really cool that they had the ability to do that because we would have gone the wrong direction. Do you have an example or? Um, not. Not necessarily one that directly comes to mind because there, there's sure. been a few, uh-huh. and, but I, I think to answer your kind of question, I, I think the biggest thing is it, it almost validated what we're doing, I think, more, right? Because in a lot of cases, um, you know, we've we've spent a number of years and kind of effort and time really trying to focus on the user experience and their research backed up pretty much most of the stuff that we're, we're doing. And I think the biggest, biggest example of that would be kind of just like placement of the search box kind of right in the header at the top and um, kind of on the mobile side of things, basically giving um, – we're, we're really relying heavily on Google's material design approach. And mm-hmm. for people that don't understand what that is um basically google a number of years ago at their annual developer conference rolled out a thing called or a a design strategy for kind of desktop tablet and phone also kind of for android and ios and if you look at any of the google apps specifically on kind of android and ios they look very similar they function very similar and what we're trying to take that approach because I want people to understand that when they switch devices or platforms that, you know, the experience really shouldn't change. And and then obviously most people interact with something Google on a daily, weekly, or at least a monthly basis. And so trying to use Google's design philosophies, you know, and piggyback off what they did and roll that into kind of our suite of um, products, then, you know, hopefully the, the user experience is consistent enough from you know, when the first time they come to Stacks or Stacks Mobile that they understand how to use everything right out of the gate instead of trying to teach them how to use our software product. So we've talked kind of in the, the big picture of, you know, it's a content management system essentially for uh, libraries. But yep. maybe let's go down a little uh, closer to the earth, uh, not at the 50,000 foot level. So what do you give them? I mean, uh, you know, some dashboards or... What what are, what are some of kind of the things that you've done that you think is different from Stacks than from other things that may be out there that make it kind of cool for people in that you know vertical? Sure. There. Well, a lot of it comes from just um, Kristen knowing the industry and kind of the feature set that um, people have been struggling with. Like basically, we're giving them um, the opportunity, like you mentioned, kind of to have dashboards and different user roles and kind of permissions. And, and feature sets that are um, kind of related to that specific industry. For example, we're we're on the we're working on kind of rolling out room booking right now. And so basically, yeah, like they could get somebody to build all this stuff custom, but it's going to cost them probably ten times as much as just an annual stack subscription would, right? And so we're basically making a SaaS product for for the library space and yes we're customizing everything for them for their dashboard and feature sets and 
roles and permissions and you know maybe they need somebody to every time they need to publish a new section or post or event that they can have the ability to have like a moderator and, and just kind of stuff like that but it's all tailored to kind of the librarian um, in their different kind of target markets. So your your partner comes from this vertical, and therefore, you know, she had the, you know, the uh, the issues in her head that formulated the desire to kind of solve the problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you said that you know that had been in you know either in her head and elsewhere for the better part of a decade. But how long have you and the rest of the team kind of been with her solving this problem to bring stacks to market? Um, I've worked at kind of the, the sister company for just over three years now, and I've been working on kind of stacks for about two, a year and a half, two years. Well, that, so today's a huge day. If it's your launch, I hope to goodness y'all, y'all are going out for some, I don't know, Labatt's or Molson, whatever you drink up there. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll probably be, we'll probably be going out uh, somewhere. That's for sure. Congrats. That's yeah, a, thanks. It's a huge day for y'all. That's really cool. Yeah, I'm excited. It's it's interesting, and and the thing is, and I think um, a lot of people, and at least in my experience, having just like a huge sales team and partner um, actually go out and sell this and kind of help with marketing is, is almost like eighty percent of the the problem, right? In a lot of startups, um, and so I think for us that's been extremely useful and we've been you know kind of we've had a bunch of beta partners and and whatnot as well and so getting their feedback um over the coming month or the previous months has been really awesome for us as well well i think you're right as a guy who spends a lot of his world in the or time in the startup world uh you know, especially I look at lots of decks. What amazes me is how many times entrepreneurs talk about the niftiness of whatever it is they've done and how cool it is and the features, et cetera, and how much money they need to raise. And they don't really ever explain how does it get out of their head or off their computer and into, you know, and, and onto, onto my phone. And then how do my dollars go back to them? And how are they going to get that thing to market and monetize this thing with all these nifty features? Um, and so it's, uh, interesting to see how much you guys have learned from the value of a very powerful distribution partner. Yeah. And the other thing too, that's been really interesting that I think a lot of people in startups don't talk about is we basically self-funded and kind of bootstrap this ourselves. Like we've been, we also have kind of a, a sister company that does, um, actual custom kind of enterprise software work. And so, you know, we, we still work on client work as well. And so, you know, kind of balancing that, and I know a lot of startups are kind of in the same boat where they still do um, client work and they just don't really talk about it that much. But I, I do like to kind of mention that, that, you know, there, I don't think there's anything wrong with with mentioning that or talking about that. And I think making people feel comfortable with, if you need to take on a little bit of product or project work or client work to fund you know your idea i don't think that's bad and i you know it, it kind of seems like in a lot of cases sometimes that gets a negative connotation in the industry but i don't think that's negative at all uh look there's no one path to success totally no 100 <laughs> you know, percent agree yeah. yeah i mean just you know if that's what you guys needed to do it sounded like that was the smart thing to do uh, you know, if you didn't have to do that, you would have been happy with that. So it's great that y'all had the prescience to understand that, hey, look, you know, we're going to need some project work to supplement this. And the other thing I think is is probably cool about that, I imagine that you, is it safe to say that in that other project work, you guys learned some things that ended up helping you back on this project, even though you wouldn't have guessed that when you took the engagement? I, I think like pretty much any product or project that you work on over your career can kind of help right and so for sure I definitely think that there's there's projects that I look back even like a decade and I'm just like oh you know that really worked in that instance and you might have to kind of modernize it a little bit because the web's changed a lot in a decade but you know the same kind of principles or theories or you know kind of how you approach that problem are still there right at the end of the day it's just software and it sounds weird to say but what, what I like about working on a product is the actual challenge. What the actual product does is kind of secondary. And I don't mean that negative. It's just I like solving kind of real big problems. 
right? And the fact that it just happens to be in the library space in, in Stax's case then is what it is, right? But, you know, doing design that works cross-platform and working with all these kind of third parties and integrations and APIs is and, you know, designing an interface for that, like, I love that challenge, right? And so it's kind of my whole career of experience has kind of helped me get to where I am now. And I, I love the kind of playing off of stuff I've learned even, you know, a decade ago. Well, so it sounds like what you're saying is, is that working across those APIs and the platforms was the biggest challenge. Is For that sure. safe to say? For sure. So you talked earlier, uh, trying to give some lessons to people saying that, you know, uh, broaden your perspectives and, 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 there should be a check on your intuition, quote unquote, a little bit, realizing that all of us have our own blinders and and it was important to have a variety of perspectives both within your organization and outside to get a better view so that you could design appropriately and you found that there were things that your intuition was wrong. So that was one lesson. Sure. What are Talk a little bit about the, what you just mentioned. How did y'all solve some of these riddles across working across multiple APIs and platforms? You know, a lot of it just has to do with getting kind of somebody from the business side, somebody from the design side, somebody from the developer side, and sometimes even getting somebody from that third party kind of API or integration company actually on the phone. Because the 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 thing that I haven't mentioned yet is you know there's times where you want to really add x feature or you know do something but if where you're if the company you're pulling data from doesn't have that feature or they're working on it you might not be able to add that right now right and so sometimes and you, sorry go hey, ahead sorry, sorry kevin to interrupt but you know how how willing able or or resource constrained were some of these apis and having somebody who would get on the phone with you and spend the time essentially working with you in the development uh, so that 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 might be solved. I imagine it varied by API provider, correct? Or? Totally. Yeah, for sure. And usually, um, you know, sometimes the bigger the company, sometimes they move a little bit slower, and they might say, "Well, that's not going to be ready for a few months, right?" So your kind of hands are tied with certain things. And sometimes it's the smaller guys that are just like, "You know, we're backlogged, and we can't get to that for a while," or "That's not in our roadmap," or. So it, it's kind of like what would you a, do? So, sorry, sorry, Kevin. Sure. What would you do? What it sounds like that happened. For what sure. What would you do? What would you do in that situation? Do you put that on pause and you went elsewhere, or did you try to solve the problem yourself? I mean, you obviously can't just stop for three months. Uh, how did y'all deal with those roadblocks? Um, I think it depends on kind of what it is. Sometimes we we just built our own version. Um, you know, and maybe eventually we'll can that and integrate with s somebody else's or we'll keep developing kind of our version. I think it's a little bit of kind of analyzing a little bit based on, you know, how long it's going to be and if we can build a version. Also, it really depends on how important that is or isn't, right? Because that's the big thing is until you're going to, anytime you launch a product, you're always going to have people that like, if I get X feature or X features, I'll sign up. And that's kind of an interesting road to play or game to play because you can chase your tail for Yeah, yeah, forever. yeah, mission creep. I mean, you yeah. just, you know, it's the, everybody's wish list is the, you know, okay, yeah, if we build the perfect app, everyone will come. Well, it, it, you'll never build it. Exactly. <laughs> and And so I think, for, it's almost like a case by case basis, right? And I think there's things that you can get away with. And I think, and anybody that's ever done a product knows that it's never done. So we're always adding new stuff, right? And and that's kind of the the nice thing about it is when you pay kind of a yearly subscription for something, you're constantly getting new features and you're constantly getting you know um, the latest kind of and greatest things and we're you know constantly making changes for the latest versions of Android and iOS and you know as Chrome rolls out new updates what is it like every eight weeks now and the other browsers like we're constantly kind of playing with it and so it, it's it's really interesting and to kind of go back to your question a little bit it's it's almost it's it's tricky because sometimes we just build it sometimes we just wait right and sometimes a lot of times onboarding a new client can take 
um, based on how they're set up, might take a couple of months, right? By the time they get content in and they get all their subscriptions set up and, and whatnot, that it, they might be able to wait three months or we might be able to wait for three months or two months for, you know, that third party to add that functionality to their API. Did you have from the get-go kind of a launch date that kind of made you guys, you know, keep on task? I mean, you know, that a looming deadline is a really healthy <laughs> Uh, constraint forcing you to make you know practical decisions yes very much so um there's kind of two sales cycles kind of in the space and one is kind of the fall and so um kind of october november is their huge their biggest kind of busiest sales season on the epsco side and so if we didn't get something out kind of late september um we'd have to wait another year so uh, let me ask you two uh, same question, but kind of for two different hats. Sure. As a creative director for a product, uh, what's the 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 one most technical thing you learned that you're very glad that you learned from the project? I, I think the big thing is is probably kind of how to optimize things on kind of the front end um, because sometimes depending on how many API calls you're, you're actually getting per page, the page mm-hmm. can be really slow, right? Especially on a, a phone, especially on an older device. And so trying to optimize that as much as possible or, you know, loading the smallest amount of data. And then once that data is loaded, go call to a bunch more APIs and pull more data, right? And so really kind of optimizing how how and what data gets pulled um, at kind of what times. I think we spent a lot of time kind of doing that. And I think that was kind of the biggest thing and and then kind of designing for that, right? Because what if that data doesn't actually come back and how do we handle that, right? And so you might not actually see that, but we need to be able to theme that stuff, whether it's there or not there. Because for example, on details for like a book or something. Um, Sometimes that book has more details than other books, right? Based on the medium that it's in, whether it's kind of physical or digital or version or volume or, or whatnot, right? And so trying to make a universal interface that handles the most amount of details and the least amount of details at the same time and kind of even side by side or in a, in a list, right? So, uh, I'm going to ask you the same question with, to, and ask you to put a different hat on. But sure. before I do, out of curiosity for our audience's sake, how many people uh, within your company, not counting your partner at EBSCO and the you know the other people that you are dealing with, how many people within your company were uh, involved in the development of this? There's probably ten to twelve of us. Okay, so uh, quite a small team by kind of startup standards. That you know, and so yeah, so it's kind of kind of a pretty small team and and we pulled this off in kind of a re- pretty short period of time so same question I asked you a minute a minute ago sure. uh, what's the most what's the most interesting thing you learned but not from a technical perspective as a guy who is a partner in a company that does uh, you know builds such applications and software from a business standpoint, what one or two things were the were the most uh, interesting to learn? Whether it was about you know marketing or or dealing with you know distribution partners, something that you may not have learned had you not been on this project. Sure, I, I think the big thing is is just kind of how enterprise operates, and it's it's obviously quite different than you know smaller kind of companies, right? And I think. The big thing is, is at least in the library space and and a lot of enterprise space, um, the software isn't that pretty or it's not really that great looking, right? Yeah, a lot of it is legacy systems that they perpetuate forever because it cost an absolute fortune to bite the bullet and and build something and try to re, you know replace it and then they've got these enormous customer bases that they have to then train on the new system and so they just perpetuate it forever. Plus. There's a guy or 10 guys or 20 within that company whose career rides on maintaining this old legacy system, right? I mean, doesn't that have a lot to do with it? Totally. And so trying to make something that's modern 
that also, you know, supports kind of an older, um, kind of back, outdated kind of system, right? Because some of those libraries run old computers, right? And so kind of trying to be modern and trying to be kind of a little bit dated, I guess, for a lack of a better term, just to kind of cover both things and in the enterprise. And I, I know kind of everybody rags on kind of Microsoft and myself included, but now that I've kind of been through it and worked with kind of a big enterprise provider, like somebody like Microsoft does a really good job at, you know, their stuff's not like the greatest looking stuff you've ever seen. It doesn't have like the greatest, you know, like it's not the prettiest thing you've ever seen, especially compared to OS X. But you look at, I guess it's called Mac OS now, I should correct that. But uh, the, the thing is, it's they do a really good job at kind of supporting and and basically appealing to enterprise, right? And it's a totally, totally different mindset. And like, yeah, you could argue that Macs kind of started to come into the enterprise a bit, but Microsoft still dominates that space, right? So now that you've done this, uh, can you do this? You know, you're you're now kind of a CMS expert, I would imagine. Can can you guys go do something different or similar for a a different vertical, or is your partner's fundamental knowledge of the industry so critical that it's not as easy to go and replicate for another industry as some people may think? Um, no, we're we're actually working on a couple other verticals um, with with EBSCO as well. So. And, you know, and those will probably launch at some point, either later in the year or early next year. I can't really talk about which verticals yet, but you could easily replicate this kind of different verticals and even potentially different industries. So they do distribute to other industries, EBSCO does? Yes, for sure. Uh, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, so it's 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 pretty cool, right? Like, it's it's exciting, and I'm, we've actually met a bunch of the guys. Like, we were in Boston kind of early... Uh, early in the year and we got to meet a bunch of them and it was it's pretty fun right like just to kind of the thing that I love about it the most and, and partly why I love doing the show is like I'm up in Canada right now you're down in Florida we're working with a company in Boston but it doesn't really matter like we're just on the phone working together right and I, I love that how the internet is basically made the world a little almost, smaller exactly or almost <laughs> insignificant right not just it doesn't really matter where you are. Your location's insignificant anymore. It's like we can video chat, we can call, we can screen share, we can do whatever, right? Is it as good as being in person? No, but you know you can still get everything done that for the cost. It is <laughs> exactly yeah, fair, fair enough, right? Yeah, that's true. So so, so let me ask you a different question. We've sure. talked about stacks and and you know and the product and how it could be taken a different direction. What? What's up for Kevin Horick next? Yeah, tell us a little bit more. I know some of the people on your radio show, but uh, you've got a TV show now too. Talk a little bit about what all you're doing. Sure. Um, yeah, like you mentioned, yeah, I, the the radio show actually has some TV episodes. I'm going to be airing some more um, right away. I'm kind of involved in a couple other uh, software startups as well that were kind of you know c- coming to the end of the prototyping phase. Um, I also write for kind of a tech blog out of Los Angeles called Tech Zulu. And so I I don't know, like I, I was thinking about it the other day. Like I don't really have any other hobbies. Like this is kind of what I do, right? Whether it's in this <laughs> space. And so um You got a kid, so that is your hobby. Yeah, exactly. Between like the family life and kind of being online constantly working on something. I, I think the big thing is is the the backstory for me at least was I was playing with this stuff years ago, kind of building band fan pages early on. Um, and that's kind of how I learned all this stuff, you know, kind of through the 90s and into the 2000s. And then my dad came to me one day and he's like, you play with all this software and there's a local uh, tech college that runs a course on this. And so I left high school a month early to actually go to post-secondary. So I was like in high school on Friday and I was like at this tech college on Monday. And then I had to go back to write like my final exams. And so (laughs) I just kind of been in, like, it's just been kind of this like wild ride ever since. Right. And it's been fun. And, and And how old are you now, Kevin? Just the audience. I'm 33. 
Yeah. Okay. I saw you in person. You said earlier on the call that you've been doing this for 20 years, and I was going to ask you, like, you know, would you start at age four? Well, so. yeah. It, well, <laughs> it was funny because I got introduced to kind of the whole web stuff when I was 12, and right, right in in grade seven, our teacher was teaching us like HTML, and we were coding and like building little websites, and so I've been doing this like that long, and like playing with it in the evenings and weekends, and. I don't know, teaching myself for, for a lot of it. It was, and it was, I never really knew you could make a career out of this, right? But time, isn't that the beauty of having a passion? I mean, uh, I think one of the reasons, I'm an ex-corporate guy and I've worked for some big companies. Sure. I think, and uh, so just to share a little bit, um, you know, I think one of the things that happens to people in those situations is, is that their passions don't align with what they're paid to do. Totally. You've some You've somehow managed to, get paid for your passion. And so I think that's probably why you seem to be so happy all the time. Frankly, that's just a personal opinion. <laughs> no, that, that's, I appreciate that. It's interesting. I, I read a quote the other day that basically said, you don't need to be professional. You just need to be passionate to be successful. And I, that, that's kind of like stuck with me for a while. And I've heard that before. And I always kind of think, I think that kind of sums up my whole career, right? Like I even think even just doing the radio show or any of the stuff I do, I, I kind of do it more casual than trying to be this like corporate type guy. And that seems to have worked for me anyway. Right. I think you're a great example of uh, aligning passion and keeping life in perspective. And, uh, and, uh, I think one of the things about you that, uh, works to your favor is, is, and I don't think people talk about this. I think being nice does a lot to others does a lot for your own career. There are selfish reasons to be nice. I don't think that that's why you do it. But it, you get repaid in spades by developing wonderful relationships that allow you to call on others who can help you casually or formally. Uh, and uh, I don't think people concentrate enough on that. Uh, just, you know, you, 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 kindness gets if, – if, if for no other reason people should be more that way because it will come back to you in, in multiples. And you're a good example of that, Kevin. Well, thanks, Bob. I appreciate that. It's, it's interesting because – well, to be fair, like you're right, because I think, well, that's how you and I met, right? Like we've kind of done a handful of things together, I guess, for lack of a better term. Like you've been on the show a bunch of times, kind of the TV and the radio show. Um, you know, we've met in person. And I like came to your event. Like we've we've kind of helped each other out throughout the last year or so since we've kind of known each other, right? And um and I think it's critical in those situations to figure out, you know, once you're comfortable, like, okay, what do you need? Like, what do you, I think one of the first times you and I talked, uh, was the first time you and I talked. We met on LinkedIn. Yep. We've talked about this on your TV show. We met on LinkedIn. We got on a phone call. And so we, I said, you know, we kind of both asked you, okay, what do you do? What do you do? I mean, beyond what was in the LinkedIn description. And then we started, you know, both trying to figure stuff out and, you know, you had started this radio show and looking for people to interview and I had started a conference and I needed to have it publicized and grow. And we came up with the idea, well, look, why don't you come to the conference, set up shop there, interview people, which gives you content. And then you put them on the show, which helps, you know, talk about my event. And, and then you kept me and then you met great speakers. And so we, we, we tried to, we, by just communicating and, so, you know, we could help, you, help each other. We came up with a, you know, a, a win-win situation that worked great for both of us. No, totally. And I think that's, that's really, I, I like kind of how you mentioned that because I think it's important for people to like, like neither one of us is giving the other one any money, like back and forth, right? Like you oh. help me out, I help you out. But I think that's important to stress, right? Like so many people are like, well, I'm not going to do that unless you pay me X amount or this or that. But you know, like, you're right, to your point, it's like, you help somebody out, and they help you out when you need help, and like, I reached out to you a few weeks ago, and I said, Bob, will you, you know, will you interview me for my own show, and you were like, sure, of course, right, and so I think, like, just having people out there that you make these relationships with, that you kind of help each other out throughout the years, I, I think is great, and, and who knows where this stuff will go, right, like, I don't know where we're going to be in a year or, or whatnot, right? Or myself or you or like, it, it's it's crazy. And I love the fact that, you know, just kind of going to your event, I met a bunch of people and now I know a bunch of people kind of all across the East Coast just from going to like one event, right? And so it, it's it's interesting how this whole thing kind of plays out. 
I give uh, uh, I, people on the show may not know, but I'm on the board of a couple of nonprofits devoted to entrepreneurship and technology here in South Florida. And then we talked about my event. So I get calls from startups all over the U.S. all the time. And I can't take all of them. I really can't because it would take up all my time. But I do try to talk to a reasonable number of people and give them 10 minutes of my time. And and uh, y- you don't know who you're going to meet. And uh, always be willing to give back. I think one of the things that I see a little more often than I'd like to see is a lot of people are – they want to get, yeah. but they don't but they don't, but they don't give. Always give too. Uh, and, if, and you can even, and you can even be a kind of person who gives more than they get because sooner or later you're going to give to somebody who you'll get back. Uh, you know, you'll get more out of that than a lot of the ones that didn't give back. You just don't know. I mean, that's for selfish reason to do it, but, mm-hmm. uh, you have to obviously, you know, you can't spend a half an hour with everybody who calls you cause you only have so many hours and you know, your time is your money, but you know, be willing to give, sure. uh, you know, uh, it'll pay again. It's just like, you know, your philosophy of being nice, you know, it'll pay back in spades. So, uh, well, I think the mutual admiration society is probably a good place for us to, uh, <laughs> to end our show. Uh, sure. I, I, as the guest host, Bob Fitz of soup X, the startup expo would like to thank our guest, your normal host, Kevin Horick today for, uh, telling us about stacks, Kevin, it's very cool what you've been working on. I congratulate you and your team on, uh, you know, years of hard work on your launch date today, and uh, I would suggest that you guys wrap up early and head to a pub and go celebrate together. Yeah, well, I really appreciate you actually doing this, Bob, and, and thanks for kind of doing this. And I guess I should kind of, um, if you want more information about Stacks, it's stacksdiscovery.com. Um, obviously, if you go to the uh, show website, uh, buildingthefutureshow.com, I'll uh, post the other interviews that uh, I've done with you, Bob, kind of in the show notes as well. I'm sure we'll have you again at some point. The privilege is mine. Thank you for letting me guest host today. Congratulations again on your 100th episode, Kevin, and best of luck. We'll talk soon. Yeah, you as well. Thanks, Bob. Thanks for listening. The music for the show is done by Electric Mantra. You can check them out at electricmantra.com and keep them in the future. 